I gave you homework. I said you were supposed to finish the following setup. Darwin, Marx, and Freud walk into a bar. Uh, I got two excellent answers. Um, I didn't get the name from the first person to give me an answer, but uh, he said this. Darwin, Marx, and Freud walk into a bar. Darwin said the equality of man is in the head because he was a scientist and was about evolution. Marx said the equality of man is in the wallet because of social stratification and all of that. Freud said that it was a bit lower. <laughs> We're doing a show in Cambridge, Massachusetts, everybody. That's right. This is geek humor. Um, but I think, I think my favorite answer that I got came from a man named uh, Jeff Cruzan. He said, uh, Darwin, Marx, and Freud walked into a bar. And you'd think that given how smart they are, one of them would have noticed. Jeff, see me afterwards for your herpes. I'll be over That's here. That's right. Um, OK, so as a few more people are gathering, let me just say a few things about the Story Collider. Um, if you like the stories here tonight, we have a website which has all kinds of fun stuff on it, storycollider.org. We have a podcast that you can subscribe to. Uh, once a week, we publish one of these stories. There's nearly 100 of them now. So if you want to hear more of these stories, you can go subscribe to our podcast and listen to them there. We also have a monthly show that we do in New York. Ben and our third producer, Aaron Barker, who's not up here tonight, she they host right that here. together. She would be right there. Uh, and uh, they host that in Brooklyn. We're normally in Union Hall. but never All right. Um, and with that, let's move it along to our fourth storyteller. Um, coming up next to the stage is a man on the other side of my sheet of paper. Um, he is a reporter for science, an author, and an MIT Knight Fellow. He writes about climate change. He also has an exhibit not quite here at the MIT Museum. It's at Massa Hall, the other one here. Massey. Say it again. I think it's pronounced Massey. Massey Hall at the MIT Museum on Extremes. Um, but again, he writes about climate change. Please welcome to this stage Eli Kitsich. <laughs> I was 19 years old, and I was obsessed with chemistry. And I think what made me most taken by this particular part of science was the idea that at the center of everything, in any mixture, in any compound, there was an essence, an element, that you could break down any part of matter and find its, act its, its purity. And I think I felt the same way about people. I felt that within all of us, we had a kind of central essence, and what made us who we were was to find that part of us that really made us who we were, and the input from others or what other people felt did, really didn't matter because inside we had the drive to, to sort of find ourselves. And so I guess it's not surprising that the summer after my freshman year in college, I ended up at a laboratory doing chromatography, which is the separation of substances um, using a medium. and. It's a central idea in, in chemistry. And we were looking at samples from the bottom of the ocean, water samples, and we were trying to find the amount of the gases that were in those samples. My boss was a genial kind of fatherly figure named Bill. He was a geochemist. We were in this kind of low-slung concrete building. You can just see me in Tevas and a t-shirt, surrounded by all this amazing equipment. And I was just, I just loved it. There was uh, this kind of very wild-eyed and really also careful and decent scientist whose job was it to look after me. Um, his name was Eugene. And Eugene had built this amazing contraption whose job was, was used to analyze these glass bottles that they had taken from the bottom of the ocean. And inside those bottles was water, which told the story of the 20th century circulation of, of ocean, ocean currents. And it was through the anal analysis of these gases we would try to understand how these currents had gone. And I was just sitting there, and Eugene was explaining to me how the apparatus worked and what we would be doing. And I just, if any of you have had this moment where you see your future as a scientist unfolding in front of you, that was that moment for me. Um, Eugene described how some years before, one of those giant um, gas canisters had fallen over, smashed its head off, and blown through two concrete walls. And I just thought that was the coolest, <laughs> coolest thing. And there was this possibility, he told me, if I showed my worth as a scientist that summer, they would take me on a research cruise to the middle of the Atlantic, where I would go with, you know, and, and get those samples um, from the bottom of the ocean with, with the instruments. 
And so there, there was the prize for the summer. But there were two obstacles. The first obstacle uh, was another summer intern. Her name was Becky. And the first thing I noticed about Becky is she was a little older than I was, seemed to have a little more experience. She seemed to be good with the equipment. Um, and she had very good handwriting. And this immediately raised an alarm. And she, would, she had such good handwriting that she would put a line through the middle of her sevens, she told me, so that no one thought they were ones. That immediately made her a threat to me. And the second, the second, the second reason I disliked her is she was gorgeous. And the phone would ring, and she would start laughing, and it suggested that there was a boyfriend, and she was sporty and friendly to everybody, and I was kind of poor, and I had no girlfriend, and I would go into the fridge, and there was this bottle of mustard, and I didn't even like mustard, but I would like spread it on bread, and, <laughs> and that was like my snack, and she would ask me about it, and it was very like, <laughs> uncomfortable. And so that was the, fir the first obstacle was clearly Becky. The second obstacle was the contraption, the analysis, this gas chromatograph. And it turned out that this process, which sounded so cool when it was first described to me by Eugene, was actually kind of really hard. It had all these parts. You had to run nitrogen. You had to prepare a cold trap with dry ice and, and alcohol. You had to get the temperatures right. You had to take this sample, um, which was a glass tube, which had been sealed at sea, um, by flame, put it into this contraption, which was essentially like a vacuum cha chamber, and somehow make a seal around it with the, um, with the parts, and then break the glass tube inside while maintaining the vacuum. Otherwise, air from the modern day world would contaminate the sample, and we were looking at air which had been added to this water, you know, decades before, which allowed us to understand the history of this water in the Atlantic Ocean. And I found it was kind of difficult. In fact, Bill would come in after a few weeks to, of the two summer interns running samples, and he would look at the charts on the printout. And if any of you have seen a chromatograph, there are these peaks which indicate the presence of the things you're looking for, the chemicals. And um, he would see these nice, distinct, tall, thin peaks, you know, kind of standing alone. And uh, those were Becky's peaks. <laughs> and I kind of saw them as fangs. <laughs> and then Bill would look over to the other shift of the analysis, and he would see these kind of, you know, Mount Vesuvius, it's kind of smeared, one peak not quite into the other, there was kind of like the cone heads or like they were obese peaks, I don't know, but th there was a problem. They were contaminated or I wasn't running the samples at quite the right rate and they would like, one sample would like run into the other during the, during the course through the chromatograph. In any event, I wasn't doing so well and Eugene took me aside and said, all right, because he had a lot of energy and he said, you're gonna get psyched, you gotta get psyched. Back in high school, the way I used to get psyched at the, for the swim team is I would take my belt off and whip myself. <laughs> and so I wasn't sure, it wasn't, it wasn't entirely clear to me that more enthusiasm was the answer to this problem. But Bill, Bill seemed to show some, some trust in me because one day I come in and on the lab bench there are these 10 gleaming samples, glass bottles. And he explained to me that these he estimated in the back of the, cal back of the envelope calculation, these had cost $250 each for the National Science Foundation to secure from the bottom of the ocean. So this felt like the test of my summer. And so I took the first one and I put it up to the machine. I checked the nitrogen and I checked the temperature of the cold trap and I made sure that the printer was working and that the computer recording all this stuff was going and I put it in and I ran it, and fat peak. So that was the first one. And the second one, I thought, oh, no, no, I'm going to do this better. And so I reach in, and I take the second sample. So I'm thinking it's $250 in the bucket, and those samples can only go through once. So I put the second one in. I get some peaks. There's some, there's some chance. So 
So I'm thinking $250, that's, that's it, that's it. So I take the third sample, put it in, contamination, $500. The next sample, I don't know, maybe contamination, maybe they ran into each other, $750. I stopped keeping track. That was a moment it felt like when my, my dream to be a scientist somehow died. Bill never said anything, uh, but you know, about a month passed, the internship ended. Um, and it, 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 I was thinking about kind of what had happened with the summer and was it that I was bad at, at bench science? And I thought about, yeah, I was bad at bench science, no doubt. <laughs> but it was boring. This actually was kind of dull, which was a kind of striking finding for someone who would really believe that inside there was this element that was science and I would just have to purify my being and that would, would emerge. And it was around this time that my father said to me, you know, Eli, you're taking a writing class in college and you're majoring in science and you, why don't you combine them and become a science journalist? To which I said, Dad, that is the dumbest idea I've heard. That is the dorkiest job to be a science journalist. And if I, I'm not even interested in being a journalist, but if I was, I would want to cover crime or politics, you know, real subjects. Um, and... You know, the truth is, as I look back on it and think about my, my attitude and my, the way I thought about the world back then, I, I, I think an, a chemistry analogy to life is actually appropriate, but I think I had the wrong one. Chromatography or separation suggests that inside of all of us there's this pure essence that is waiting for us to kind of like bring to life. But the, I think the better analogy is that life is a series of reactions and that through experiences you actually change and it's, it's your experiences in life that make you who you are. And so I think if you were to look at a chrom chromatograph of me right now, you'd probably see at the very beginning little peak distinct that says, you know, he's not very good at menial tasks involving, you know, close collaboration, you know, dexterity and, you know, taking <laughs> measurements very carefully. You'd probably see another peak after that, you know, distinct, tall, clear, he can, he's a decent writer, you know, this, these experiences in laboratories like helped him realize that science is about, you know, kind, uh, you know, professors who lead their laboratories and their wild assistants and their hot summer interns, <laughs> you know, so, science is a social thing. And then I think you'd next on the chromatograph see a small peak indicating that I weirdly put mustard on everything now. <laughs> Um, followed by a very unfortunate peak I'm a little embarrassed about, which is that my parents are almost always right. Um, followed by the final peak, which is that uh, I always cross my sevens because you don't want someone to think it's a one. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs>